there are people and uh, welcome you to all for this uh, virtual program berlin history and highlights of a great city berlin has been called edgy poor financially rich culturally liberty historical international and never ending maria fogarasi spent 10 years in this fascinating capital and will focus on favorite highlights of his city which marked the 75th anniversary of its world war 2 surrender on may 8 2020 if you have any questions throughout the presentation please use the chat or question answers feature to send it out and we will answer them at the end of this program my here is maria and everything is for you now go ahead maria thank you thank you uma thank you and good evening everybody thank you for joining me on this journey to explore berlin i was very fortunate to live there for 10 years as 29 years all together in germany the last all not all uh, all, all different times not in one stretch and so we moved there in 2002 my husband was assigned to the us embassy as the commercial minister meaning responsible for promote, promoting and supporting us business and then it went from there so this is a 90 minute show so i hope you are, are sitting comfortably and i love to talk about berlin so welcome and i always start with the opening slide of the brandenburg gate which has been renovated the gate was on the East Berlin side during the Cold War years, so it didn't always look like this. But after Germany's reunification, it was renovated. And right after we had moved there, actually it was 2002, um, there, it was covered with a big curtain and former President Bill Clinton visited Berlin and pulled a rope and this gate was unveiled. This gate has become the symbol of United Berlin and United Germany. So this is my, my cover slide. So let's just take a look at Germany today. It's borders and borders will probably stay that way. Germany has quite a few neighbors. It's got the Baltic Sea and the North Sea, and then everything from the Netherlands to Belgium, to Luxembourg, to France. Then you've got Switzerland down here in Austria and the Czech Republic. So during my talk, most of my talk, Germany will be divided. But right now we're going to look at the capital of Berlin. Berlin had been the capital of Germany up until 1945. Uma mentioned the date of May the 8th. May the 8th, 1945 is when Germany capitulated. It was the end, marking the end of World War II in Europe anyway. We call it Victory in Europe Day. It was always also complete coincidence, Harry Truman's birthday. But after 1945, Berlin was not permitted to be the capital city anymore because of what had happened during the war. Germany and Berlin were both divided into four sectors and Berlin lost that status. So in 1945, we had to find a new capital for what would be West Germany because there would be East and West Germany. And there were four cities that vied for this title. And the stipulations were that you had to be not so close to a border or border of an occupation zone. You had to have fairly decent, be in fairly decent shape, i.e. not so much destruction from the war. You had to be able to provide enough housing for government officials who would eventually move there. And of course, support the financing of the government buildings. So there are four cities that vied for this title. Um, one of them was Stuttgart down here in the South, but Stuttgart just didn't have the finances to carry through on its bid. And then there was another city two hours north of Frankfurt, which is not pictured here, Castle, but Castle had been too heavily damaged in the war. So basically the choice came down to Frankfurt on the Main River right here, or Bonn on the Rhine River. Frankfurt were the, the liberals, the social democratic party. Bonn was the Christian democratic party for many different reasons. Um, some people say because the first chancellor of post-war Germany was Konrad Adenauer and he came from a tiny little village next to Bonn. Named, and so Bonn was chosen as the capital to go forward. This would have been in 1949. Up until then, Bonn had been known for being just half an hour south of Cologne with its very famous cathedral. Bonn is a university town and also the birthplace of Ludwig van Beethoven. So Bonn became the capital 
Then after Germany reunited or re reunified again, we always talk, the world talks about the opening or the fall of the Berlin Wall on November 9th, 1989, but reunification didn't really happen until a year later on October 3rd, 1990. So just earlier this month, Germany would have celebrated 30 years of reunification. And after that happened, the government was still meeting in Bonn, but eventually they took a vote and Berlin really just squeaked by. 337 to 320 were the votes to move the capital back to Berlin. 337, such a close vote. So the capital went back to Berlin. Bonn has maintained the status of a federal city. And in many ways, despite the highlights and the dark sides of Berlin's history, it was appropriate that the capital move back there. This is diverting for just a minute. We will be talking about the border and I want you to see what um, Germany has done with its former East and West border. This is called the quote death strip because obviously this was impenetrable. And if you tried to leave from the East, you were in danger of being killed. So they've kept it and now it's a, it's a nature reserve because on the West you could always go up pretty close to the border but on the East there was always a no man's land. So they've turned this into, um, it's a lovely way of marking history with uh, hiking and biking and historical markers stretching from the top of the country down to the bottom. So this is Germany after World War II. This would have been after the negotiations had taken place with the, with the United States and our allies were Great Britain. The Soviet Union was still our ally. We hadn't really realized, or we were just starting to realize in the summer of 45 that they had a completely different philosophy from what we had. And then France. And France had a smaller portion of Germany when it was divided into an occupation zone because the Vichy government in Paris had been pro-Nazi once Germany took over France during the war. And then you see Berlin here and Berlin is going to be divided in the very same way. So how did this happen? When did this happen? Well, the negotiations for this started at Yalta and at, in Tehran with uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Stalin and Churchill. But this is where the world leaders met in the summer of 1945 to finalize these divisions of post-war Germany. This is a gorgeous English, English country manor style house, not in Berlin, but just to the west of Berlin in a town called Potsdam. Uh, you have to cross a river to get to Potsdam. The river was, uh, the bridge had been destroyed. So they actually had to build a pontoon bridge once these leaders landed and came over there. And this beautiful, beautiful building was built during the years of World War I, 1914 to 1917, for the last Kaiser of Germany, Wilhelm II, his older son, when the son was married, this was his wedding gift, quite a wedding gift, right? The son married a woman named Sicily from Northern Germany. And so Sicilienhof is the name of this beautiful building. Wilhelm, the last Kaiser of Germany was the grandson of Queen Victoria. His mother was actually Queen Victoria's eldest daughter, eldest child. And so it does look a little bit like an English country manor. So this is where they met. And this is another view of Sicilienhof. You can tour it now, you can tour either the downstairs and see the rooms where the, uh, the world leaders had their, had their offices and where they met at the negotiating table, or you can tour upstairs the rooms which the crown prince and his wife and their family shared. Um, even though there was no more monarchy after the end of World War I, 1918, the family had uh, um, use of the um, home during that time. Kaiser Wilhelm himself went into exile to the Netherlands in 1918 and passed away there in 1941. So Potsdam would have been in East Germany. This gift of the uh, red star flower arrangement was a gift from uh, Joseph Stalin at the beginning of the negotiations. Again, July, roughly the 17th of July to the 2nd of August, 19. 45. And it was during these negotiations that Harry Truman realized he was not on the same wavelength with Joseph Stalin. He tried very hard, especially to negotiate for Poland into our sphere of influence. Unfortunately, that never happened. So these are the, this is a very popular motif on postcards and on magnets that you can buy as a souvenir at Sicilianhof. So on the right, you have the wily Joseph Stalin. Then you have Harry Truman, who had literally just become U.S. president 
Franklin Delano Roosevelt passed away in April of 1945, and Harry Truman had never even really expected to be vice president, let alone president, and FDR really hadn't shared a lot with him. Truman was not one of the East Coast stalwarts FDR had been accustomed to dealing with in his life. So he was a bit naive going into these negotiations, but he did quite well. And then we had for Great Britain, Winston Churchill on the left, who was actually voted out of office during the break in those in that in that summer meeting and so he was replaced by the prime minister clement attlee churchill was later on voted back into office uh in the excuse me in the 50s for great britain so these three men were hammering out the negotiations for the division and the occupied zones in germany and also in berlin and just as i said that you know, we had the four uh, in, in for all of Germany. This is what we had for Berlin. We've got the allies, our allies now, the French, British, American sector, the Soviet sector. We thought they were our allies, but it evolved differently. So the Soviet sector is synonymous with East Berlin. And you have to realize that Berlin is an island now in the middle of East Germany for the entire length of the Cold War years. And even though the wall was not built immediately, I always like to put the statistics up there so you can see the length of the border and the length of the wall that eventually surrounded West Berlin. So between East and West Berlin, you have 27 miles. And then between West Berlin and East Germany, you have 69 miles. So it was a total of 96 miles around West Berlin. It was actually quite a construction feat the way that it came about and the way it evolved over the years. Uh, so some, and we will keep coming back to the Brandenburg Gate through my talk, it's sort of, sort of a theme. So on the upper, upper left right here, once the wall had been built, this would be the Brandenburg Gate. I had said that it was in the Eastern half of the city and the wall was built out like this so that no one come could come close to the gate. Then over here, you would be looking at the wall from the Western side. Achtung, Sie verlassen jetzt West-Berlin. Be careful, Achtung, you're leaving West Berlin, a warning. And it's right about here where Ronald Reagan would have stood when he shouted out those famous words to Mikhail Gorbachev, the then leader of the Soviet Union, Mr. Gorbachev teared on this wall. And then down here, you have November the 9th, 1989. We will hear in a few minutes that the wall was not the first place. I mean, the Brandenburg Gate was not the first place where the wall was breached on that day. But of course, this became the iconic picture that went around the world and just the jubilation that this was really happening. So the Brandenburg Gate was built in from about 1789 to 1793. Um, Berlin, you must know that Germany has 16 states and it has among those 16 states, three city states. So Berlin is a city state. It's actually the hole in the middle of a donut. It is the hole and the, the state of Brandenburg surrounds it. So way back when there were city gates leading out from Berlin to Brandenburg, and this is one of them. This is the only existing one. And when it was rebuilt, it was built in a much more grandiose fashion. The architect would have been Karl Gotthard Langhans, and it was supposed to show the power and the might of Prussia. And indeed, you can see that this beautiful classic style, classicism, and then the Doric columns. And it was said that the, the um, like if there were a Kaiser or any kind of a leader that he or she always, well, it was always he in those days, would always come through the middle uh, section of the gate and then the foot soldiers and everybody else on the side. These days, if you have a VIP uh, world leader or any, any head of country visiting Berlin, it is customary for the German chancellor to walk through that middle section of the gate uh, with him or with her. And then on the top, you have this statue here, gorgeous statue of the quadriga, quadriga for four. You'll see there are four horses. And this is Pax, the Roman goddess of peace up there. Here's a close up uh, in the back. You'll hear about that dome uh, a little further into the talk. So here she is with her chariot and she's up on top of the Brandenburg Gate. So a couple of other pictures of the Brandenburg Gate. This would have been in 1806 when Napoleon came to the city. He was still on his victory crusade. He hadn't quote met his Waterloo yet. And he's over here on the white horse and he is going to be handed the key to the city. 
When he was there in 1806, his soldiers actually took the quadriga, the statue from the top of the Brandenburg Gate. It's heavy, believe me. And they took it back to Paris as war booty. And then Prussia was able to get it back in 1814. It's been up there ever since. So this is Napoleon. This is at Christmas time leading up to the gate, the famous Parade Street and Victory Parade Street, Winter in Linden, under the linden trees, all illuminated for the holidays. This would be a Christmas postcard that I have where every year the tree is put up at the gate. And um, starting just a couple of years ago, there is also a menorah, the largest menorah in Europe that is put up at the same time to honor Hanukkah. So you've got this motif at Christmas time, at holiday time. This is the Festival of Lights. So just when you think the summer tour rush is over and the Christmas markets haven't you know, haven't begun yet. You have the Festival of Lights it started in 2005 and it's been running every year. This year it ran actually in September. I think it had something to do with the 30th anniversary of reunification and it's beautiful. These are gorgeous illuminations of many, many downtown buildings, monuments, churches, statues, and they are sometimes video installations. They send messages and themes. And so this would be the Brandenburg Gate one year during the Festival of All of Lights. This is another year where it's covered in roses. This is a postcard that I bought. And so the Festival of Lights, if you get a beautiful autumn evening, it's just, it's just be you know, walking around seeing all this downtown area, it's really a treat. So this would be in 2013 when our President Obama visited Berlin and he's sitting up on a podium with Chancellor Angela Merkel. She has been the Chancellor of Germany since 2014. She will be stepping down in 2021. She has been a strong advocate of an ally of the United States, advocate for very strong Europe, advocate for the transatlantic partnership. She's done, she's done a very commendable job. She is probably the, if not one of the most powerful women in the world. Her background, she never started out to go into politics. She is a physicist, so she's a scientist by training. This had um, served her very well during the beginning of the COVID crisis, the, um, the uh, scientific way that she went about uh, um, you know, handling it. Um, unfortunately, Germany is also with the rest of Europe in a second wave now. And I heard today from a friend that they're considering a nationwide um, lockdown for certain hours of the day of night. But back to Merkel, she was born in 1954. She was actually born in West Germany. Her father was a pastor and was assigned to a parish in East Germany. East Germany was an atheist state, so it didn't honor or recognize religion, but there were some churches allowed to keep on practicing. So she's sitting up there with President Barack Obama. Uh, Merkel, Angela Merkel, has a very, uh, has a, um, a husband who's also a professor, a science professor, I believe it's chemistry or physics at one of the universities in Berlin. He is rather shy and retiring in the sense that he keeps out of the public eye and he never came to her in inaugurations or anything, but he obviously hit it off with the Obama family when she was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor and they traveled to Washington, D.C. Um, like I said, he must have hit it off because on this day when the two uh, leaders are sitting there, the um, Professor Zauer is his name. He was touring Michelle Obama and the girls around the city. So this was a blistering hot day. I was really fortunate to be able to be in the audience. You don't see the audience there. And the, our president actually took off his coat when he started to talk. So another thing about this, there is a subway stop underneath the Brandenburg Gate. And during the Cold War, the subway stops in East Berlin were not in use. So in other words, if you were using the subway and you went from West Berlin through East Berlin and back again, the subway stops were all sealed off. There would be a guard standing there with a machine gun. So this was slightly reminiscent. There was no machine gun, but the subway stop on this day because of this presentation was sealed off and no one could stop or get on or off there just as a matter of security. So this would be the Brandenburg Gate on that occasion. And this is a really cool occasion. This is the World Cup in 2006. You can see the gate down here. And this is what is called the fan mile as it has come to be known. 
where they use it for the Euro Cup or the World Cup or also on New Year's Eve. Um, there's very heavy security now around it on these events. Obviously, nothing's happening this year because of COVID. So in 2006, Germany hosted the World Cup soccer games in 12 different stadiums around the country. They didn't win. They came in third. They did win in um, 2014, eight years later. But what I wanted to point out here is that Germany is not necessarily such a flag flying country like we are. They tend to be very hesitant. The world will you know, look to the past and, oh, is that a sign of German nationalism again? That's not what we want. But on this occasion, as Germany hosted these games and did very well, you started to see many, many of the flags, the black, red, gold, uh, the like, clip-on little kind you can put on your car window or out of the windows of the, of the homes or the apartments. So it was really just a really lovely, healthy show of patriotism that took place in 2006. So here's the gate hosting one of those games on the big screens. And this is the other side of the gate during those soccer games in 2006, there was a small mini soccer museum put up. Obviously this was just for the games. It doesn't exist anymore, but I like the way that football looks showing that soccer captures, captures the, whole, the whole world. And this was on the 25th anniversary when the, new, the when the wall did open up. So it opened up, or we'll say we'll say from well, it fell from now on on November 9th in 1989. So this would have been in 2014, and Germany was trying to think of a way to honor this. And this was absolutely fabulous. There were two brothers who came up with this idea, and so they took that section of the east-west Berlin border, the 10 kilometers that went through the very heart of the city. And they had this balloon brigade. These are balloons, but not, you can't just pop them with a pin. They're more durable uh, than that. And they were on stands. And so they were, you, you wouldn't just have supported a balloon as if you were buying an ice cream cone. It did cost money, but companies could could sponsor a balloon or maybe a group of families. And they snaked through the inner east-west Berlin border because it's really hard, even if you're looking at maps and in your, you're in Berlin downtown and you see the cobblestones and they'll outline where the wall went on the cobblestones, it was really hard to, to imagine it. So this was a fabulous history lesson for anyone not living at that time or who had never visited Berlin. Berlin has a river running through it, Spree, and this is literally just almost next to the Brandenburg Gate, this illumination. So this whole event lasted for three days, 7, 8, 9, Berlin, 2014. And then on the night of the 9th, there was a VIP concert at the Brandenburg Gate. And then the balloons were released by the by those who had sponsored them. So released up into the heavens and the wall, quote, fell again. It was a wonderful way to commemorate this 25th anniversary. Um, this is Walter Ulbricht. We are talking about the wall. We're going to wonder how did this wall ever come about? Well, this man was in charge of East Germany. He was the top party secretary when East Germany was formed. And in the back, you see the East German flag, very similar to West German, except it's got those wheat sheaves and hammer and sickle in the middle. And Walter Ulbricht followed Uncritically, he followed the orthodox Stalinist model of industrialization for his country, meaning that he promoted uh, the heavy industry over consumer goods, and it didn't matter how much they cost or whether they were whether they were easily available or whether it made any sense for his uh, country. So chronically, the country was um, so consequently the the country was chronically short of consumer goods, and. Um, in fact, if you sent a package to your relatives in East Germany, the, some of the favorite uh, contents would be a coffee, good, German, good West German coffee, chocolate, and ladies' nylons were very popular in these packages. So he, and that was when the wall was still open. Sure, there was a border and you had to show a pass coming and going, but you could work on one side and live on the other side. And people in the East started to notice that people in the West had a better lifestyle and there was a brain drain and there was quite a significant brain drain. So by 1961, about 1.65 people, 1.65 million people, had fled to the West. So Walter Ulbricht came up with this idea of a wall, but here he is in June, this newspaper at the bottom is dated the 15th of June, 1961. 
And he's saying, niemand hat die Absicht, eine Mauer zu errichten. Nobody has any intention of building a wall. Now, I have to just take this phrase for a minute and jump completely out of my history lesson because nobody has the intention of building a wall. Berlin has a new airport that was supposed to be opened in 2012. Its planning goes way, way back to the late 90s when they thought they had three airports and they needed a grand new airport for the new capital. And this airport, much to the horror and embarrassment of West German, of Germany, which is known for technical expertise and engineering excellence, had lots and lots of problems and is actually finally supposed to open this coming weekend on our Halloween. So, and this is an advent calendar. Germany is the country of advent calendars. Usually they have some religious motif or angels with snow or chocolate or something like that. But this says, this is the airport Allen uh, calendar and it says 24 doors that never open. It was a spoof because it took so long. But basically what I want to tell you is Walter Ulbricht, remember his phrase, nobody has the intention of building a wall. So throughout the years now, there have been postcards. Everybody knows what Walter Ulbricht looks like because the postcards say nobody ever had the intention of opening an airport. So it was a spoof on his phrase. But going back to Ulbricht, okay, that was the 15th of June when that newspaper came out. And what happened on the 13th of August, 1961, Berlin and the world woke up to this horror that the city really was being divided. And here the wall is being built. There with those concrete blocks, they had steel girders and the concrete was poured over the steel girders reinforced. Um, here they are still working on it. Of course, in the West, you could go up, you know, to uh, very, very close proximity to the wall. And um, in the East, no one was permitted to get near the wall anymore or that, that border area. Here you see people in the East desperately fleeing those who were able to still leave and taking whatever they could, possessions just to get there over to the west before the border was sealed completely. And this would have been the initial uh, border um, in the west. Again, there's a cemetery right up against the, um, the wall, whereas on the east, there's a no man's land. And as time went on, this no man's land became more and more sophisticated. The guard towers were built. There were um, automatic, very sadly, automatic um, shoot to kill, the motion sensors, and the young East German guards, this was the worst assignment you could possibly get the, if you were uh, supposed to be up in one of those guard towers, because there were escape attempts, and your orders were um, to shoot to kill, very sadly. So this is Konrad Schumann. He was a young East German soldier. This is before the walls being built, but he sees the writing on the wall and there was already this barbed wire. And so he took a flying, literally took a flying leap. This is a popular postcard motif in Berlin. You've got the four sectors and he jumped over to freedom and his jump became an iconic shot that has survived all of these years, Konrad Schumann. Um, East Germany then came to be, West Germany and East Germany both came to be in 1949. It took some time after the end of World War II to sort that all out with their very different constitutions and, and regulations. So 1949 to 1989, here you have East Germany in October of 89, celebrating 40 years of existence. The DDR, Deutsche Demokratische Republik, German Democratic Republic, they would call themselves translated into English. And of course, there were lots of military parades, sort of like the Soviets used to do in Moscow, a lot of pomp, a lot of circumstance, but there had already been in the summer, a lot of protests during the night, during 19, during, during those summer months in East Germany, there was a restlessness in the air and, uh, and, and it would go it would go on to highlight with the opening of the wall. But this is the parade in early October, celebrating the 40 years. Here you have um, Mikhail Gorbachev. I had mentioned Ronald Reagan standing at the wall saying, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. This would be the gentleman who really did not support. This is the last leader of East Germany, Erich Honecker. Um, so when the wall opened up, Gorbachev would have had the power to stop what was happening. There were in 1956 in Hungary and in 1968 in Prague, both revolutions where those countries tried to throw off the Soviet yoke. They were unsuccessful. The tanks rolled in and those people 
uh, didn't didn't have a chance. But this didn't happen in 1989. Gorbachev didn't lift a finger. And some theorize that Honecker just kept on with that same old East German that 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 um, like I said, Walter Ulbricht that model of industrialization, that old fashioned model. Here you have uh, Gorbachev who was promoting um, perestroika, which was, he was promoting trying to restructure the political and economic city as a system or glasnost transparency and Honecker didn't follow any of that. So one theory is that Gorbachev just let him fall, but here they are hailing the parade. So the protests were going at you know, great speed and East Germany realized they had to do something. So they decided to give their citizens a certain measure of freedom as far as travel went. It was very restrictive. Usually you could only visit the West if you were over 60 or 65 of a retirement age than if you were lost to the West. Um, and then, you know, certain people who had who had uh, been able to emigrate, but it was very few and you couldn't, basically you couldn't leave East Germany. You could travel in the East Bloc, you could ski in Slovakia, or fly to Bulgaria and have a vacation on the Black Sea uh, shore, but you couldn't go to the West. So here's the government spokesperson, Gunter Schabowski, on the 9th of November in East Berlin, giving this press conference and telling people that the government has approved some more liberal travel restrictions. And one of the questions came to him, well, when does this go into effect? Well, he was completely taken aback. He hadn't really expected that question. I don't know why. And so he stammered out, well, he said, I think immediately. And that was November 9th, 1989. That was the beginning of the end because when East Berliners heard this, and here you have just north of the Brandenburg Gate, a bridge called the Bornholm Bridge. It was one of the border crossings in between East and West Berlin heavily patrolled at that time and during the Cold War years. And here you have it on the night of November 9th, 1989. Absolutely massive rush of people of East Berliners coming to the border, saying to the border guards, we're coming back. We don't want to leave. Our homes are here. We're just really curious. We want to go look and driving their little Trabant cars and the guards looked to their superiors for any kind of direction. There didn't come any orders to stop them. Thank heavens it was peaceful. There was no violence. And this was the beginning of the fall of East Germany. So you can imagine the euphoria for these people um, over in the West, some of them seeing friends or relatives they hadn't seen in 45 years. It was very... Uh, um, it was uh, very emotional to say the least. So this is the Bornholm Bridge. And um, then of course the um, Brandenburg Gate, the scene where the people are sitting on the gate that you saw earlier. So this was a movie that came out in the early nineties. It's called Goodbye Lenin. And it's a very interesting movie. It's very poignant and it's partially a comedy because the woman in the bed was a very staunch party communist citizen living in East Berlin. And she had been out with the demonstrations that summer and fall, and she had fallen and hit her head. So she was unconscious on November the 9th when the wall fell. And her children were really afraid. She had a weak heart, and they were afraid that if she found out her beloved East Germany didn't exist anymore, that she might have heart failure. So her son here decides to recreate East Berlin in her living room. And he has a friend and they get old newsreels and they recycle these news stories. And the son goes out to the um, try to find the things that she likes to eat. East Germany being a communist country, there was no privatization. So for instance, the fruit and vegetable store just said fruit and vegetable, the bread store said bread. There's a very famous pickle brand from just outside Germany called Spreewald Pickles. And they would just say Spreewald pickles on the jar. There wouldn't be any brand name. So he has to go find that. And it's just a great movie about how he manages to do this and keep this going for so long. And one day when he's not home, the mother's feeling slightly better. And she goes out and in the park next to where they live, she sees this statue of Vladimir Lenin being hoisted away. This had been her lifelong hero. She had followed his philosophy. And that's how they get the name of the movie, um, Goodbye Lenin. So it became a real cult film. And um, it's, a, it's a great movie. I like it a lot. This is one of the places where you would go if you were touring in Berlin. You're, I'm, this picture is being taken from up on a viewing platform and an area where inside there are all kinds of history lessons. They're bilingual in English and German. 
And this is Bernauer Strasse. This is a street that was divided by the wall and those apartments closest to the wall on the East Berlin side, uh, um, nobody was allowed to live there anymore. The windows were boarded up. And so here you're looking down. So they've recreated the, uh, the, the wall. Here you see the steel girders without the concrete. And here you see what the wall looked like. And then you would see the no man's land with the guard tower. So this is a very popular tourist destination and also field trip destination for German school children because they don't, well, people don't want, it's easy for youth to forget, right? Oh, what, there was a wall? I could have just hopped over it. No, you couldn't. So um, this is the Bernauer Strasse Memorial. This church over here is very modern. There was an older church standing here, but East Germany detonated it after the wall was built. It was, uh, its proximity was deemed uh, too close. So this is a very modern church that's gone up since then. And let's see, this is a cross point in town, fairly central. It's about 10 minutes walking time, time from the Brandenburg Gate and it's called Checkpoint Charlie. This is on that same weekend where I had said that the balloons were marking the east-west Berlin border. So I thought when I moved there, so there's a picture of a young American soldier up here. And on the other side, there is the same young man, but he's wearing a Russian uniform. And Checkpoint Charlie was the cross point in Berlin where you would cross from the Western sector to the Russian sector. So if you and I had been in Berlin and we had a visa to go over to East Berlin for half a day, uh, that was very popular because we had to change a certain amount of West currency. And then we had to spend it while we were there. It was uh, so books and records were beloved souvenir items because they were very inexpensive over there. So I always thought just Charlie was the name of, you know, popular name in the US. But then I learned that it was part of the military alphabet. So Alpha Bravo Charlie, checkpoint Alpha would have been where you came out of West. Hello. Hi, Maria. Yes. There is one question. I mean, uh, somebody, I think Barb. Uh, she went through Checkpoint Charlie in 1977, I think. <laughs> she shared her experience here. <laughs> okay, yeah, well, then she can relate to what I'm talking about. So, um, so Checkpoint uh, Alpha, yeah. yeah. Uh, Checkpoint Alpha would have been when you went from West Germany onto the transit road, and then Checkpoint Bravo would be where you got off the transit road and came into West Berlin and this would have been Checkpoint Charlie. So very popular and huge billboards near, near here, all in uh, giving history lessons, um, 365 days a year, 24 seven, as we like to say, and free for the public to read and enjoy. We had uh, two, our two older children were in college when we were in Berlin and they had a lot of friends who came through and didn't have any money. So I had a whole list of attractions and places that are free. So Checkpoint Charlie, literally the billboards around it are a history lesson. And uh, one more last tribute to the 25th anniversary salute to the fall of the wall. This was indeed the route that the balloon, so would have been following the border and you can see how it zigzags and it might not e mm -hmm. always be easy to imagine. So Maria, there is another one. Another, you know, uh, okay, last week, can we do it at the end of the program? Yeah, could we do that, okay. Uma, like last time? Uh, that would be great. Yeah, sure. Um, thank thank, you. You. thank, thank you. you. And mm -hmm. thank you, everybody who wants to share their experience, too. I appreciate it. So this is Berlin on the 30th anniversary of the fall of the wall. This would have been last year in 2019. There's the gate. And this was an undulating blue and white wave of plastic strips, 30,000 of them for 30 years, each with a wish or an experience of somebody, how the wall had affected or not affected their life. And one more, this, so the 30th anniversary of the fall of the wall would have been last year, 2019. And I had mentioned 30 years of reunification would have been this year. So that if this would have been just on October the 3rd, celebrating 30 years of reunification. This is actually in Potsdam where those pre those post-war negotiations took place and it's a newspaper clipping. So now we are going to look down on this street here. The Brandenburg Gate is down here and we're going to talk about these trees and we're going to make our way up to where the palace used to be and then look at this cathedral. So when this Victory Parade Street was laid out, these linden trees were chosen with great care 
they didn't just arbitrarily plant any old tree. So going way back to the ancient Germanic tribes, they believed that the linden tree had the protection of the goddess Freya and could protect against lightning and illness. And many, many linden trees were planted all over Germany in towns and villages and in the town square. The ancient tribes did not believe in holding court indoors. So that was always under a linden tree. The annual dance into the May would have been under the linden tree. And it was always a very iconic symbol. If you look at the Wagner operas, you have Siegfried, the hero who bathed in dragon's blood, but a leaf of a linden tree landed on his shoulder and became his, so to speak, Achilles heel. He was later uh, hit there uh, by an arrow and unfortunately killed in those Wagner operas, that German, that German mythology. The wood of the linden tree is very soft, so you cannot make furniture out of it, but it makes for great wood carvings. And the blossoms have a very sweet, sticky sap, which can be made into honey. There is one hotel, the Westin, just off of this street, Unter den Linden, that sells little jars of honey for five euros. It's terrible to park your car under a linden tree because it's really, really messy. But um, anyway, so these are the linden trees. This is an old motif that I found with the trees leading up to the gate. And this would be the trees during the Festival of Lights. And then again at Christmas time. So once again, the linden trees were planted with great purpose. And this is back at the gate showing Berlin in 1945, utter and total destruction. Of course, they also started the war. So the gate, again, looking very, very different in 1945. So the gate is over here and we're looking at this wooded area here, which is called the tear garden, which literally means an animal's garden. So you might think it's a zoo, but it's not. It was a hunting ground for Prussian royalty many, many years ago, 300 years ago. But then eventually it was decided starting on the Sunday that the citizens should be able to display their finery. And it went on from there. And eventually it became a popular park for everybody. It's open. Um, these trees did not exist anymore after World War II because the desperate population for heating chopped them all down. So all the trees that you see here have grown up since 1945. And this is the fan mile that I mentioned going down and it goes all the way down to this statue at this column here, this victory column. And this is the, yeah, this is the victory column commemorating Prussian war victories in the 1870s and 1880s. And standing on top of it in all of her glory is Victoria. Victoria is 27 feet tall and weighs about eight tons. And right after we had moved there in 2002, she received new gold plating to the tune of something like 4.3 million euros. Um, this whole victory column, you saw where it was quite a distance from the Brandenburg Gate. It probably would have been destroyed during World War II because it used to be very close to the gate. But when Adolf Hitler was planning his new capital of the world, Germania, it was going to be called once he took over the world, he and his architect Albert Speer were laying out what Germania would look like. And they moved this column to its new location. You can climb, I think it has 283 steps. You can climb up to this area here and you can get a nice bird's eye view all over everything. So this would be the victory column. And this is the base, which depicts some of the murals from the battles that were taking place when Prussia was having these, uh, these victories. Um, this is the Reichstag. We saw the dome when I was showing you the quadriga, so you can see how close the two are. This is the seat of government for Germany. This was built during the time when Wilhelm II was the Kaiser. Remember I said that he had to abdicate in 1918. So he was very much against parliamentary democracy. Remember his mother was the uh, older daughter of Queen Victoria. He wanted absolute power. He and his Chancellor, the Iron Chancellor Bismarck, we call him. And so he built this, um, this uh, seat of government at the other end of the um, small inner part of Berlin at that time. Um, after reunification, there was a contest held and there was a gentleman named Sir Norman Foster who designed this globe that's been put, or it's a dome actually, that's been put up on the top. 
So you can go up at the top here. You should sign, if you know when you're going, you should sign up on a line because it's very popular. It's free. You just have to show your passport. And then you take an elevator up there. And this is a bilingual history lesson around the bottom. You can peer down into the chambers of the German parliament. And then you can also walk. Uh, it's kind of a, like a snail-like arrangement with headphones in 12 different languages. Go around that snail and hear about the landmarks. If you didn't think of it ahead of time and you still want to go up and there are no bookings, there is a restaurant up there called Kafer. It's a bit on the expensive side, but you could make a booking at Kafer to go up in the afternoon for cake and coffee. Then you wouldn't have to pay for a whole meal and you still get up to the top and you still can see all of these things and all of the surrounding area. So this building, actually the Reichstag here, this burned in 19, so it was built in the 1890s and in 1933 it burned. That was when the Nazis were just starting on their rise to power and getting a grip on the country. And it is believed that the Nazis actually started this fire, although someone else was accused because they wanted a pretext to clamp down on civil liberties and on the socialists and on the communists. And so it did burn in 1833, but again, has been rebuilt since that time. Uh, this is a, another very popular postcard motif in Berlin. This would be the young Soviet soldier hoisting the flag on the top of the Reichstag on May 2nd, 1945. When we landed at Normandy and our troops were coming across Europe, we were at the Elba River, which is about two hours away from Berlin. And General Eisenhower said, well, the Soviets are going to reach Berlin first. They are our allies. So, you know, we'll let them get there first. And indeed, it was a it was quite a battle of Berlin. I think there were 80,000 Soviet soldiers killed, but the Soviets also wreaked total terror on the city. Some said that the Soviets right after 1945 were worse than the end of World War II, because one must remember that Hitler's armies had invaded Russia and had caused terrible, terrible misery. Luckily, they didn't succeed. But uh, when the Soviet soldiers got to Berlin, they were given license to just not hold back and they could uh, kill, rape, steal. There was no code of contact, conduct, unfortunately, for the citizens of Berlin. But anyway, this young soldier is hoisting this flag. And here you see it on a stamp that was issued by East Germany. They're celebrating at the top of the stamp the 25th anniversary of being freed from fascism, which is what they called the end of World War II. And this is actually very interesting if you're a stamp collector because you don't often have countries in the world where you can see a very exact date of when they came into existence and an exact date of when they ended. So for East Germany, one could theor theoretically have a, a finite stamp collection that will never ever grow because the country doesn't exist anymore. And this is the Reichstag in 1990 after reunification, actually, I think it was 1995, sorry. So the um, the German government hadn't started meeting there yet, obviously, and the Bulgarian artist Christo, who passed away earlier this year, was given permission to cover the Reichstag. Christo was known for his avant-garde installations. He also did something once in our Central Park. And so the Reichstag was covered for about 10 days. And as you can imagine, this was a huge tourist draw. And I read that this plastic wrap that was used uh, was all recyclable when it was taken down. So this is 1995 for 10 days in the summertime. It will probably never look like this again, but it was a great show. So here he is, Kaiser Wilhelm II. I put his, the name of his wife up at the top because I always think it's fascinating that the royals have so many names. Kaiser and Augusta, Victoria, Friederike, Luisa, Feodora, Jenny. And again, he was quite a vain character. He um, ruled with his iron chancellor, Bismarck. And this is a bit of trivia if you're ever on a German Jeopardy show or something like that. The Germans call 1888 the year of the three Kaisers because you had Wilhelm I ruling and passing away in 1888. Then you had Kaiser Wilhelm's mother, here she is Vicky, and her husband, Friedrich III, coming to the throne. And unfortunately, Friedrich III already had cancer of the larynx. So he ruled for only 99 days. History is full of what ifs, but they had so many ideas about parliamentary democracy. History could have been completely different had he lived. And then you have Wilhelm coming to the throne in 1888, 
hating that idea, abdicating. And again, I told you he went to the Netherlands. So 1888, the year of the three Kaisers, just a bit of trivia there. And when I showed you the Unter den Linden, the trees, and I said we were going to come down and see where the palace used to stand and the cathedral, this again is the Spree River flowing through the city. The palace was damaged during World War II, but not heavily. And then to the dismay of the world, East Germany didn't want anything to do with royalty or even the concept, and they detonated and brought the whole thing down. And there was a huge outcry, but what was done was done. So this palace has been uh, rebuilt in a different way through private donations. And it partially, I mean, so it exists, just a portion of it exists now, but it's not a a palace for royalty anymore. It is um, some museums and some libraries for the Humboldt University, but that is what it would have looked like originally. And now we're going to take a look over at the Berlin Cathedral here, this gorgeous cathedral. This is a Protestant cathedral and there was a church here, but Kaiser Wilhelm had it rebuilt, much more powerful, much more stately to project not only a religious significance, but also the power and the might of Prussia. Um, when we moved to Berlin, I had only lived in Catholic parts of Germany up until that time. And so we went up to the Baltic Sea and we were looking at the town of Rostock and we were in four different churches and they were all Protestant. And finally, I said to somebody, you, this has to be a Catholic church. We haven't seen a Catholic church anywhere. And the man said, oh, no, no. He said, no, 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 not here, not since 1517. I thought, 1517, what does he mean? And then I learned that 1517 was the year when Martin Luther uh, nailed his 99 theses to the church door in Wittenberg, which is about two hours from Berlin. It's a great outing. They have a superb museum there for religion and also bilingual. And so Martin Luther brought the Protestant Reformation into rolling. And this is a Protestant area. There are church, Catholic churches there now. After World War II, many of the refugees who came were Catholic, but it's, in, uh, it's uh, essentially a Protestant state. So Martin Luther also translated the Bible from Latin into German. So he brought it closer to the people. So he did that in 1517. Reformation Day in Germany is October 31. It has nothing to do with our Halloween. It's a complete coincidence. But um, uh, so, so 1517, so 2017, October 31, that would have been exactly the 500 year anniversary was a holiday 